I will welcome back to our series called Current Culture. And today I'm going to speak on the last lesson in this series called Just Wars in a Fallen World. We're going to talk about war. If you think back through our uh, history, if you think about a timeline uh, through our country's history, wars have been some of the biggest events that have happened and taken place over the years. We had World War One and Two. We had the Korean War starting in the 50s. We had the Vietnam War after that, and then Desert Storm. And then now since 2001, we've been dealing with the war on terror. Well, if we go a little bit further back in time again, H.G. Wells wrote a book called The War That Would End All Wars. And he was writing this during the time of the Great War, and he was giving his opinion that he thought that this war was going to change everything, that it would change the way uh, societies interacted with each other, and um, that it would cease uh, future wars from happening. Well, unfortunately, he was wrong, and that Great War he was writing about became known as World War I. And just 21 months later, World War II started. So he was incorrect. Now, if somebody were to tell you today, um, well, the war that's going on right now, it's going to end all future wars. There won't be any more war. Well, what would be a correct response to that? Well, I think a very obvious one is this, that there will always be wars. And the reason is because the world is full of sinners. We can be confident that there will always be wars on this earth, the here and now, because the world is full of sinners. Therefore, since we know that there are always going to be wars uh, during our lifetime here, it's important that we have a biblical understanding of war. We have to understand what the Bible says about war and what our, what our view or position on war should be. So we have to take a look at the scriptures. And taking a look at the scriptures, we need to look at both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, both are relevant to us. Both contain God's word to us. And uh, so we need to look at what both Testaments say. And when we look at the Old Testament, uh, most most of you probably know the Old Testament has a lot of war in it. It's, it's full of war and conquest. But if we take a deeper look um, and we start to examine um, the, the, the verses more closely, we'll start to realize that there is a narrative there and that God had a plan for the coming Messiah. So as we begin the lesson today, uh, we're going to first take a look at the biblical uh, perspective on war. And then secondly, uh, at the end of the lesson, we're going to look at the Christians' um, positions on war, or what they might be and, and what positions we might take. Uh, so go ahead and join with me in this lesson, and we're going to start with the biblical perspectives on war. And we're going to begin with the Old Testament and war, and we're going to start uh, specifically with the war that happened in the Promised Land. Well, in Genesis chapter 14, after Abram rescues his nephew Lot, uh, he encounters Melchizedek, who is the priest of the Most High God. And Melchizedek blesses God for the victory over Abram's enemies. Now, as we read through uh, the Old Testament, we need to be careful that we don't necessarily draw prescriptive teaching from descriptive narrative. Well, what does that mean? It means this, that when we're reading an account of something that happens, when we're reading through history, it doesn't mean that we are necessarily to do the same things that we're reading about. Okay, We're, we're reading a narrative about history. Okay, So it, it's not necessarily creating a rule or a law for us to follow in all cases. But as we read through uh, this account, um, we do have to take note that, well, uh, God blessed Abraham and his victory, his military victory over his enemies because it was for a righteous cause. Okay, so therefore, 
uh, through this blessing, we see that God is portraying war in a positive light. So that's something interesting we need to keep in mind. Well, let's take a look at what God's role was, what he said his part was to play in Israel conquering the promised land. Well, let's look at Exodus 23, uh, starting in verse 23. It says, For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. Now, a little further down in verse 28, it says, I will send hornets ahead of you so that they will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites before you. And then in verse 31, I will fix your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the river Euphrates. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you will drive them out before you. So God said he would go before Israel to annihilate their enemies. He was going to send hornets to drive the enemies out of the land. God was going to deliver the inhabitants into Israel's hands. Well, that might bring you to ask a reasonable question. Well, why? Why was God going to destroy all of Israel's enemies? And why was he going to destroy all of the inhabitants of the land of Canaan? For that answer, we're going to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 9. We are going to read verses 3 through 6. Know therefore today that it is the Lord your God who is crossing over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them, and he will subdue them before you, so that you may drive them out and destroy them quickly, just as the Lord has spoken to you. Do not say in your heart, when the Lord your God has driven them out before you, it's because of my righteousness the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is disposing them before you. It is not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you are going to possess their land, but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God is driving them out before you in order to confirm the oath which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Know then, it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess. For you are a stubborn people. So God says he's destroying those in the land because they were wicked and evil and deserving of death. This is not something we like to hear, but these people uh, that are being destroyed were not innocent, righteous people, but they were wicked. Just a few things that these people living in the land of Canaan were doing, they were worshiping demonic idols. They were involved in detestable sexual sins, and they were sacrificing their children to these false gods. God says that the people of Israel were not worthy of the promised land. The only reason they were getting the promised land was because of the promise that God had made to Abraham. God describes these people as stubborn because they were constantly worshiping other gods instead of fully surrendering themselves to him. So it was by God's grace that he was leading them, to, uh, he was leading the people of Israel to this promised land. In Joshua 24, we see God reflecting on um, the conquest of the promised land, and he's, he reflects with approval. Again, it's, it's not because the Israelites were worthy, but it was because of his grace. And he says, um, because of my grace, turn away from your idols and completely worship me. That's what God wanted from his people. And in reality, um, we, like, it's only because of God's grace that we are still here. Right? It's only because of God's grace that he hasn't wiped out and destroyed humanity. Because we are all sinners and we are all sinful and wicked at one point. 
Okay, so um, God's grace has a lot to play um, with what we're talking about here. Later, then, God describes, or uh, sorry, God chooses King David to become king of Israel, and then he blesses him in his battles, and he enables him to succeed in all the, the wars and battles that King David was fighting. And um, David recalls how God was constantly delivering him from his enemies in his battles in 2 Samuel chapter 22. Let's go ahead and read verse 31. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tested. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. And look down a little bit farther at verses 40 through 41. For you have girded me with strength for battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also made my enemies turn their backs to me. And I destroyed those who hated me. Well, King David says that God's ways are blameless or perfect. And he describes how God gave him victory over all of his enemies. David understood that God was acting in his perfection when subduing his enemies before him. Secondly, let's look at war predicted in the Messiah's future. In the Old Testament, God helped Israel's kings to conquer the Promised Land, and it also predicted the coming of the great king, the Messiah. Let's read Psalm chapter 2, verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall shatter them like a potter's vessel. I've put up a picture of a shattered pot on the screen. Can you see how this picture might help us to understand David's prediction about the Messiah? Those who oppose the Messiah, their destruction will be violent and complete. The threat of death faces all of those who refuse to submit to God's Son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We can see that in verse 12. Their destruction will be like this pot. The Lord's Messiah is a warrior king who will one day smash the rebellious nations, smash them as if they were just a clay pot. Isaiah described the Messiah's future rule as peaceful, just or fair, and righteous. But before the peaceful reign of the Messiah, he will slay the wicked with the breath of his lips. Isaiah 11, 4-5 But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. The innocent Messiah suffered and died to cover our sins. He didn't die because he was weak. He didn't die because he opposed all violence. He died willingly. He willingly submitted himself as a lamb going to the slaughter. Do you remember when Jesus uh, spoke in the synagogue? He read from the scroll that was handed to him, um, and he quoted from Isaiah chapter 61. Let's take a look at that for a moment. If we turn to Luke chapter 4 verse 16. And we'll read through this passage. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the scroll and found the place where it was written, which is Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So, the Messiah is going to minister to the afflicted. He's going to preach the gospel to the poor and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. But 
Jesus did not quote the second part of the verse uh, from verse 2 of the prophecy. The, the, the second part of verse 2 says, And the day of vengeance of our God. The day of vengeance of our God. The Messiah came the first time to bring the good news of salvation. But he's coming a second time to bring vengeance on the enemies of God. To bring vengeance on those who oppose God and want nothing to do with him. This is the complete picture of the Messiah as we look through the Old Testament. He's not just a sacrificial lamb. He's not just a conquering warrior. He's not just the Prince of Peace. He's all three of them. And uh, when we have this proper understanding, it's important for us as it anticipates uh, the teachings that come in the New Testament about Jesus and war. So with that, let's transition over to what the New Testament has to say. And we are going to look first at Jesus' teachings and actions in regards to war. Well, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. And he also told his disciples, But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Well, the nation of Israel's, their, their civic code, had a law of retaliation. Remember, if, if you, you might recognize it, called, it's called an eye for an eye. Okay, the law of retaliation. But Jesus is not talking about governmental administration here. He's talking about personal matters. He's talking to his disciples about being wronged by someone personally. So from his teaching with on the Sermon on the Mount, personally, as followers of Jesus, we are not to use the law of retaliation as an excuse or a valid reason to take revenge on someone when we've personally been wronged by them. That's where he was teaching uh, to the group and to his disciples. Jesus later came in contact with a centurion officer. All right, This is someone who was hated, a Roman officer, hated by uh, the people um, that they ruled over. They did not like the Romans. Yet Jesus uh, marveled and praised this centurion for his faith and decided to heal his servant boy who was sick and, and needed healing. And he never, during that encounter, um, spoke out against his occupation or made comment on it. Um, Jesus also used warring kings and battles to describe uh, counting the cost of discipleship. He, he mentioned that a, a king, before going out to battle, should count the cost to see whether or not you know, being outnumbered, if he could still defeat his enemy. Now, even though this is just an illustration, um, I, I think it's a valid point. Because I don't think Jesus would use something that's intrinsically evil, such as war, to illustrate something that's good, such as discipleship and counting the cost to follow him. Okay, without further clarification, that, that just doesn't seem reasonable. And one more example from Jesus' life is when he made the scourge of cords and he cleared out the temple. Now, this very aggressive act from Jesus uh, did not violate what he was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. It didn't violate that. Remember, Jesus was talking about taking revenge uh, on someone who has personally wronged you. But Jesus was filled with zeal for his father's house, and that's why he took action in the temple. So those are a few things, a few teachings from Jesus, and a few actions that we see in the New Testament. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at Jesus, it's his death on the cross. We have to look at his death on the cross. At his arrest... Jesus told Peter, For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. This is not a universal principle to never take up a sword. In the context here, 
Jesus is rebuking Peter for cutting off the ear of the high priest's slave. Jesus is setting up the apostles to spread the gospel to everyone. They are to proclaim the gospel and get the word out. And this kind of armed resistance would have threatened the purpose that God had for them. We also know um, that Jesus had to die at the hands of wicked men to fulfill scripture. So this is just another reason that Peter uh, should not have been trying to stop what was going on. When Pilate asked Jesus, Do you not know that I have authority to crucify you? Jesus responded and told Pilate that you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. Did Jesus deny government authority here? No, he didn't deny it, but he simply told Pilate that he was subject to God's authority. Paul describes to us that Jesus had victory over the powers of darkness when he died on the cross. The cross was the climax of the spiritual warfare that Jesus was engaged in against uh, demonic forces while he was here uh, for his earthly ministry. And he uh, was victorious. And yet we still know that the, the future uh, is where Satan and the uh, evil spiritual forces of this world will ultimately be defeated. But Paul claimed that Jesus was victorious in that battle or that warfare. Well, thirdly, let's take a look at the second coming of Christ. In Matthew chapter 22, we read the parable of the marriage feast. And Jesus describes a king who sent armies out to destroy those who murdered his servants. Jesus is indicating here that what the king did was appropriate. The king had subjects who murdered his servants unjustly, and therefore he was justified to destroy those murderers and to set their city on fire. Later, the king ordered an illegitimate guest at the feast to be thrown into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is using a king's just punishment of evildoers through warfare to illustrate that one day he would have just punishment that he's going to hand out against all of his enemies. And he goes on to predict that this punishment is coming uh, at his second coming. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 25. We read, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom which has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then verse 41 says, Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So there will be two contrasting roles that Jesus will have at the start of his kingdom on earth. He is going to grant entry into the kingdom of believers, but he's also going to be sending unbelievers into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Paul assured believers that God would punish their persecutors. Let's look at that section of scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. And to give rest to you who are afflicted, and to us as well at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, executing vengeance on those who do not know God, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of of his might. We now know that both the Old and New Testaments say that Jesus will destroy his enemies when he comes back to earth. At his second coming, Jesus will ride a white horse to judge and wage war. The armies of heaven will follow him. 
and from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the wrath of the rage of God the Almighty. When Jesus comes again, it will be as the warrior Messiah and conquering king. The earthly armies that oppose him will be killed. Well, how come you don't often hear about this side of Jesus? How come you don't hear this about the Messiah? You know, you hear that he's loving and he's kind and he wouldn't do anyone any harm and he's okay with the way you're living. How come we don't hear this side of it? It's because Satan has lied to us. This is a lie from Satan who is the father of lies. When you believe this, it lulls you into thinking that you're okay with God, that you're acceptable to him just the way you are. But the truth is, he is coming, and there will be a day of judgment where he will judge you uh, for your sins. Okay, Every time you sin, you're storing up God's wrath for you. So don't buy into this lie. Don't think that that Jesus is just loving and accepting of any way you want to live and anything you want to do because it's wrong. He is coming to judge the world and to judge sinners and to cast them into the lake of fire. It's a hard truth, but it's a truth that we must cling to and we must share with others. But to get back to the issue of warfare, both the Old Testament and the New Testament affirm key truths. First of all, when Jesus first came to earth, he came in a non-violent way because the purpose of coming the first time was to die on the cross for our sins. And he taught his followers and his disciples that they were to be non-violent in their personal lives and that they were to be non-violent in the spreading of the gospel. But Jesus also upheld that government authorities uh, were divinely appointed by God and were instruments of wrath to be used against evildoers. Jesus was not a pacifist. He proved it by the war he waged on the devil by going to the cross and dying. And he's going to prove it again at his second coming when he destroys all of his enemies. Now I will talk about the Christian positions on war. Christians hold to two main positions on war. First is pacifism, which holds that war is never right. Or secondly, just war, which holds that war can sometimes be right. People on both sides will use Jesus' teachings to support their position and refute the other. But I will begin with pacifism and their arguments. Pacifists will use Jesus' teachings to defend their position. They believe that Revelation culminated itself with the person of Jesus Christ, so therefore the New Testament, and specifically Jesus himself, should be our instruction and our gauge on how we uh, respond to this ethical issue. Jesus blessed the peacemakers. Jesus forbid his disciples from using the sword. Jesus told us to love others and to do good to those who hate us. They say that the Sermon on the Mount uh, established right conduct for Christians at all times. Killing is always wrong because Jesus told us to resist the evil person. And to resist the evil person with force is always wrong based on the command to turn the other cheek. They also say that the cross has ethical uh, implications for us as well. Jesus suffered injustice without striking back, and this serves as, as an example for us in the way that we live our lives. And Jesus died for everyone. Therefore, to take someone else's life uh, for whom he died is wrong. And a final thing they believe in is um, they don't believe there's any distinction between what a Christian does privately as an individual and what they can do publicly uh, together with others. But what I'm going to do, that that's some of their arguments, but now I'm going to critique uh, some of these pacifist arguments. So first, 
Their point about private versus public duties in relation to Jesus' teachings is important for Christians who disagree with pacifism. They point out that pacifism fails to recognize that a person's private duties are not the same as his public duties, and that personal duties are not the same as the state's duties. For example, a person might turn the other cheek when personally attacked, but that same person has a responsibility to protect his child from a similar attack, using force if he has to, to make sure the child is safe. The state has similar responsibilities to protect its citizens. The command to love our enemies does not mean a person or a state should just sit passively by while an enemy does harm to those in his or the state's care. Protecting those in our care is not prohibited by the command to love our enemies. These commands have to do with private duties. Those commands should not be applied to public duties. Hopefully that makes sense and this chart helps you to see the differences. Jesus did not use violence to overthrow the government and he didn't encourage his followers to do so either. No, he taught them uh, to turn the other cheek. He taught them to resist the evil person in the pursuit of their gospel ministry. Um, they weren't to take personal revenge against the evildoer. However, not taking personal revenge against insults and even persecution is different than self-preservation or protecting loved ones or, or your own country. There's a big difference there. Um, when it comes to the ethical implications of uh, the cross, well, when, when Christ died on the cross, it was God's justice against sin and the eradication of evil. It wasn't just about Jesus living a perfect life. No, he was, he was fighting the battle against sin and death. And if you remember Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 53, um, Christ came as the sacrificial lamb to prevent his using force against his enemies. It was a prevention for, that was the reason he came the first time. But the second time, when he comes back to this earth, he is coming as judge and king, and he is going to demand justice um, for those who have turned away from him. As for the taking of life of someone who Jesus died for, how could even God condemn anyone to hell if Jesus' death for sins prevents people from being punished in any form, right? We, we know this isn't the case if we look at Romans uh, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is the God who inflicts wrath unrighteous? I'm speaking in human terms. May it never be, for otherwise, how will God judge the world? And then if we go to Romans 13, verse 4, it says, For it is a minister of God to you for good. It's talking about the government. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword in vain, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So these are clear that both God and the governing authorities are righteous in their actions to execute wrath on evildoers. That's an interesting thought, right? Both God can en enact judgment and justice, and the governing authorities that he's instituted in place um, can as well. Well, that's going to lead us to our second position, which is just wars. Okay, let's talk about just wars. This is the second position, and first, we must look at Jesus' response to Pilate again. Jesus acknowledged Pilate's God-given authority over his life. When Pilate asked, Do you not know that I have authority to release you, and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus replied, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. 
Now, whether this refers to Pilate's authority over Jesus specifically or over affairs in general is not clear. But either way, from what Jesus said, you cannot rule out the government's right to bear the sword. Romans 13, most uh, known for um, giving this authority, says this. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist have been appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists that authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of that authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword in vain, for it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of that wrath, but also because of conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. It is very clear from this passage that the government has the right to use lethal force to punish evildoers. And if scripture generally upholds the God-given authority of human government to bear the sword against evildoers, Jesus could not have been denying that right in his teaching. Scripture cannot contradict scripture. Secondly, interactions with soldiers. Well, I had said previously that Jesus had an encounter with uh, a Roman centurion. And he marveled at the centurion's faith. But he by no means uh, hinted that the Roman officer was doing something uh, displeasing to God and that he shouldn't be in that line of work. John the Baptist had a similar encounter as well. And there were some Roman soldiers who came to him and asked John the Baptist what they should do in their fruits of repentance. And John did not tell them to quit being soldiers. I think both of these interactions that we have recorded in Scripture imply that the government is instituted, it is God-ordained uh, to rule and to um, punish those who do wrong. And I think that a believer can honor God by serving faithfully in the military. Third, Jesus' teaching on violence. The moral teachings of Jesus and other uh, passages in the New Testament all point towards non-violence for individuals and the church, but never for governing authorities. For example, when Jesus told Peter to put up his sword, that has to be understood in the context of Romans chapter 13. And that's by no means saying that the government isn't allowed to use uh, the sword to enforce laws and restrict evil. No, the teachings in the New Testament and from Jesus uh, restrict individuals and churches from reacting in a violent way. Fourthly, Jesus' role as conquering king. A final point we must look at is Jesus' role coming back again as a conquering king. Evil is why wars must be fought, and not all wars are just. It cannot be said that wars are intrinsically evil. If war is evil, well then how did God help the nation of Israel to conquer and take over the promised land uh, through warfare? Or if war is evil, how does both of the Testaments predict the coming of the righteous Son of God by slaying his enemies through warfare? Or as Paul asks in Romans 3, 5, and 6, if the God who inflicts wrath is unrighteous, then how will he judge the world? While it is true that 
evil necessitates war. The defeat of evil um, by just war is not in and of itself evil. Whether it's through that one of those God-ordained government authorities or by Jesus himself at his second coming. Well, let me talk briefly about enlisting questions, you know, whether it's right to enlist or not. Well, God doesn't require you to enlist in the military, but one day you may be required to enlist by the government. And when that happens, you need to know uh, what the right choice is. Um, you need to know whether it's going to violate God's will or not. You can serve honorably in the military and, and fight for a good cause. Or there could be a time where it's wrong to be in the military. Because maybe there's a dictator who's using the military to pursue something that's evil. Or maybe he's uh, suppressing the rights of Christians. Uh, I mean, the list could go on and on. You need to know ahead of time whether or not it's uh, worthy to be in the military or it would be acceptable in God's will. Be thankful that we live in a country that has freedom as up to this point, as there's a lot of people around the world that are facing these difficult scenarios. And a, a second thing I want to mention is this. We need to be praying for our military. Serving in the military uh, takes a lot of dedication and a lot of sacrifice. And we need to pray for these people. Pray for those in the military serving right now and pray for those uh, who have served in the past. We want to be grateful for their service. But pray for them. We need to pray for their safety as they're traveling abroad. We need to pray for their testimony, uh, that they stand strong for for Christ and, and in what they believe. And we need to pray for their, their families, as it can be very difficult when you're separated from loved ones, especially for a long time. So I encourage you to pray for those in the military. Um, that, is, uh, that is definitely something honorable and worthy to be praying for. Well, let's go ahead and go into our biblical response to the uh, current cultural issue of wars. And... Our response should be, consider war from a biblical perspective. Consider war from a biblical perspective. You have the two, um, you have the two different positions that many Christians believe in. One is pacifism, and I gave some arguments along with some critiques. And there's also the position of just wars. There is times uh, when it is right to be uh, engaged in war and to participate and um, we we just have to understand war from a biblical perspective and I think going back to the study of the Old and the New Testaments really puts that into light looking at Jesus the Messiah and his view on war and how he treated war both in the Old Testament how he set war aside during his first coming but again the purpose of war is to fight evil, and when Jesus comes back again the second time, he is engaging in war. It's going to be very hostile, um, and there's no more time for uh, forgiveness and repentance. He's coming back as a judge, as a conqueror, as one who is going to punish evil and destroy them like that pot that I showed you. So keep these things in mind. I hope you learned a lot during this uh, lesson. And uh, let me just share with you the memory verse uh, for this lesson that will help you um, to remember some of these truths. And it's Revelation 19, verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sits on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. So keep these truths in mind, and uh, may God bless you as you continue to grow in your faith.